There we go. And pull in our Zoom audience here. And we'll just give everyone a, a moment here to join us. Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today for the Friday webinar. This is the last installment of the Friday webinar for the year. And we're very excited to have back Cecilia and Elnor. It's been a couple of months, I guess, since they were here. I didn't realize it had been that long, um, but they've been with us multiple times throughout the year and last year. And we're very excited to have them talk to us today about Canadian music. Um, we're gonna resume the webinars later in mid-September. So we're gonna take the summer off here. And any, anyone in the meantime, go back to the CCTV YouTube channel. We're streaming live there now. And look at the webinars over the past year, over the summer, if you like. If anyone's going to be at the CFMTA conference later in July 6, 7, 8 in Edmonton, I'll be there at a booth. Come and say hi. I'll have Christopher Norton with me. Uh, and he would like to meet you as well. If anyone's out there in Alberta or planning to attend that conference, be nice to see you. And otherwise, in the meantime, just stay tuned to your inbox. We'll have an update later in June on a few things that we're working on. And we'll have some email updates in the late summer to launch the next webinar series for next year that we'll host the same way on the CCTV YouTube channel, as well as over Zoom. So thanks for taking the time to join us today. Those of you here live, you can ask questions in the Q&A or in the chat box. And those of you on YouTube, feel free to email us. And thanks for watching later after the fact. So Cecilia and Ellen are welcome today. And thanks for joining us. I'll turn this over to you now. Thank you, Derek. Um, actually, we were supposed to talk about Canadian composers, uh, but we ran into some glitches and a lot of that has to do with copyright um, and uh, yeah, basically copyright. So we're going to deal with that a little bit later. And what we're going to do is talk more about some British composers and some really some more lighthearted music, uh, fun music. So uh, Cecile, you want to tell us about our first one? Yeah, the first one we're going to talk about is uh, Veronica Dussek Cianchettini. Uh, she was born into a family of musicians and, and composers. Her father uh, was uh, a very well known uh, pianist, harpsichordist, composer. And she's the sister of Jan Ladislav Dussek, uh, known by many piano teachers for his sonatinas. Um, around level six to level eight. And, but she also had another brother, Frank Benedict, who was also a composer. So the three children studied with their father, the whole, their whole formation. Uh, she was born in 1769. So she was the, 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 the youngest. Uh, Jan was born in 1760, so nine years older and the other brother was four years older. Uh, she herself became a very well-known uh, performer as pianist, harpist also, a singer and as a teacher. Now, uh, in 1799, she moved to London where her brother, Jan, was already well-established. Um, he was a virtuoso pianist. It, it's worth, worth uh, saying a few words about him. He was a virtuoso pianist and a composer, and he was one of the first pianist virtuoso to travel widely across Europe uh, to give concerts. One of the best regarded and uh, regarded pianists in Europe before Beethoven's uh, rise to prominence. And he was seen, uh, they, I should have said, the, the, she was born in Chicoslo what is now Czechoslovakia. And, and, and Jan was seen as the representative of romantic Czech music abroad. He was the first one to sit at the piano with his profile to the audience. He was also instrumental in extending the, 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 the size of the piano forte with Broadwood in England. Uh, also one of the most fashionable professors of uh, the day. So uh, Veronica realistically would have been able to benefit up to a point uh, by his musical reputation. For example, I noted that uh, she was signing her compositions by V. Cianchettini, sister to Mr. Dussek. Um, so it's reasonable to 
think that she was, when she moved to London, she was hoping to be uh, on the tails of her older brother. Um, and I'm saying she able to benefit up to a point because yes, he had a very enviable uh, musical reputation, but he was, he led kind of a scandalous life uh, and that would not have helped her. He had to, um, to leave different cities for scandals with involving high ranked women. Um, so uh, shortly after her arrival in London, she married Francesco Cianchettini, who was a publisher. And they had a son, Pio, who became also a pianist and composer. Uh, she was quite active in London. She gave her debut piano performance in 1800 and performed her own works in concert on, until at least 1807. After that, we have little info about um, her life. She wrote two concerti, a number of solo works for piano, uh, two sonatas, uh, variations, military overtures, waltzes, Rondeau and a march um, using the theme of um, La, La Marseillaise, the French um, anthem. Uh, the Victory at Talavera and the Hungarian Quick Step, a military rondeau. And that's what I'll play for you today. It's, um, it's interesting and a it's interesting to see that many of our works have been inspired by the military, which is not uh, what is considered usually as a, a, a feminine topic of interest. Um, so it would be interesting to know why. So anyway, here's a military rondo. Um, a quick step is, is a spirited march tune, usually accompanying a march in quick time. There's no date. Uh, but the first known news of the word quick step was around 1811. So that gives us a good idea of when she composed it. <laughs> on after that. So it's quite a long piece. Um, it's fun to play. Uh, it's happy, lively, cheerful, uh, definitely good for the soul. Um, it's not easy, as you can see. Uh, technically quite challenging, in fact. There's the Alberti bass, 
Um, it's always good, I find, to uh, have the student play solid chord with the right hand. To minimize the movement and make the fingers work as efficiently as they can. Um, of course, lots of finger technique, uh, scale, um, evenness of 16th notes is very important. So you practice with, with rhythms. Um, in regard to scale technique, um, I find I have to tell students, you know, to play fast. Of course, you want to minimize the movements. And often it's, I have to remind them to keep their hand high, all that in straight line, and the thumb playing side tip so that the hand doesn't go down and up when they turn. Um, as you could hear here that there's a lot of changes of uh, sudden changes of, of dynamics, contrast of dynamics, uh, and it's a rondo form. So that's an interesting piece to talk about the structure of the rondo form. And of course, the contrast between the sections. Um, if you're looking for a subtle piece, this is not it. Uh, it's more of an outlet. Um, and I find that these days, many students, they need that kind of pieces um, as they are readjusting to a, a post-COVID life. Uh, I find that some of my students are still anxious, tense. Um, this piece is, let's say, it's, it's fun, it's less serious, has more humor than your regular classical, uh, early romantic piece. And um, it, it's bright, it's joyful, merry, it's uplifting. I had fun working on it. And it gives them some, um, I would say, flexibility regarding the, the, the tempo. They can play faster and they enjoy it. It really helps pushing the, the technique. It's, it's technically challenging, but freer in spirit. And it's, it's very easy to find pleasure when you practice that. Um, personally, I would easily see uh, a teenage boy play that piece. Uh, and I would certainly suggest it to one who has a good technique and he wants to play a fast piece. Uh, no hesitation there. Um, if I can uh, open a parenthesis here, I think it's very important uh, that male students be made aware of the existence of women composers from the 18th century on and, and that they play their works. Uh, then hopefully we would hear less often things like I heard again, less than two weeks ago. Uh, there's a reason why these pieces don't appear in piano syllabi, or there's a reason where those pieces uh, are not played anymore. Meaning of course that they were simply not good enough to pass the, the test of time. And, and that is said usually by people who had never looked at the repertoire and who are not interested to do so. So of course, it, it's understood that it's not because a piece is written by a woman that it's a guarantee it's gonna be good. But we can say the same about many pieces written by men composers. Gender is not a guarantee of quality. But the fact is that many neglected pieces by women composers are indeed very good, very interesting, challenging, and fun for students. Uh, and that their disappearance from the regular repertoire is due to other reasons than the, their quality. And, and this is, uh, being at level nine, this is, I think, an ideal piece to convey that concept to the men of tomorrow. And now, Eleonore will talk to us about Clara Kathleen Rogers. Thank you. Actually, you just gave me an idea about this, this piece. I have a student uh, who's finishing level, is grade eight, 
and uh, he doesn't like to practice scales and his technique needs some work and i'm just thinking this would be a perfect piece for him you just inspired me on that uh but yeah i think this would be an ideal piece for him to work on so uh that's what i'm going to be giving him as soon as he's done his exam <laughs> I, I'm good. I, I, I was thinking the same. I, I'm going to use it with some of my students also. I'm thinking too, I might let him figure out the fingering. To come up with fingering and, you know, of course, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But that way he'll understand the importance of fingering because you can't play this piece without proper fingering. No. No, I it's think too, it, it, yeah. it, it's too intricate. Some passages are too intricate. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think I think uh, you gave me a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> but it, it's fun to uh, to sit at the piano and to figure it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Because of the nature of the piece. I have a couple of students right now that you know where their scale fingering is atrocious, and yeah. I'm trying to tell them that we don't just do scales. We don't, as teachers, we don't assign them just to torture students. Although that can be fun, <laughs> but uh, that. Really, it's it's like memorizing the times tables. You when you practice scales, your brain is remembering the patterns. So when you encounter these scales in pieces, your brain automatically goes into the pattern. Your brain recognizes the pattern and automatically goes into the correct fingering without a lot of thought. So I think you know a piece like this. It really is is a great one where they can take some ownership and try and figure out what the fingering should be. Yes, absolutely. It's practical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Applied. All right, let's move on to yeah. Kathleen Rogers. Um, she was born in England in 1844 to a musical family. Her grandfather was a cellist. Her father was an opera composer and was the first music teacher his children had. Her mother was a, was a singer. At the age of 12, the family moved to Germany to further the musical education of the children. Clara was denied acceptance into the Leipzig Conservatory, but that decision was changed in 1857, so she would have been 13, in view of her talent, so she was the youngest student ever admitted. Two of her siblings also attended the conservatory, uh, but the father returned to England while the mother stayed with her children, and that was a trend that continued through most of her career. While at Leipzig, she studied piano, har uh, harmony, part writing, violin, cello, and voice. Composition classes were not open to women at the time when she was first there, but the, admi the administration made a composition class for girls in 1859 after hearing her string quartet that she wrote at the age of 13. One of her classmates was Arthur Sullivan, and he copied orchestra parts for her, found players, and arranged a performance of the piece. So she spent three years at the Leipzig Conservatory, graduated at the age of 16. She went on to pursue a career as a, an opera singer, and she debuted in Turin, Italy in 1863. After touring Italy and five years in London as a concert singer, she came to the United States in 1871 with an opera company. Her singing career ended in 1878 when she married Henry Rogers. He was a lawyer in Boston. And they had many artistic friends, such as Amy Beach, um, Ruth, Margaret Ruth Van Lang, George Chadwick, Oliver Wendell Jones, Amy Lowell, Henry Wadsworth, Longfellow. Actually, Longfellow wrote a poem, Stay at Home, My Heart and Rest, especially for Rogers. She had weekly musicals at her home and helped to promote the careers of her artistic friends. During her marriage, she took up teaching and composing, which she said was a delight, amounting at times almost to intoxication. By the early 1880s, she'd begun publishing some of her songs with the Arthur Schmidt Company. She helped found the Boston Manuscript Club and was invited to join the Manuscript Club of New York in 1895 by Amy Beach. In, uh, she joined the faculty of the New England Conservatory in 1902, where she taught voice and began to write music. Her literary works include six books on diction and technique and three autobiographies. She died in 1831, and her correspondence and manuscripts are kept at the Harvard Library. Actually, I looked into the Harvard Library online, and yes, um, her books on singing are, are all there. All right, so the scherzo. Uh, is in rondo form, actually not 
sorry, let me uh, go back on the ABA form. A very lively A section. <laughs> challenges I found the repeated notes it's easy to do to rush them so important to really maintain and I would probably detach a lot of the left hand or a lot of the quarter notes just to add that lively character another challenge in the third line we have these jumps in the left hand So it's getting um, accustomed to the keyboard geography. She has interesting imitations starting at measure 25. We have the melody in the right hand, imitated in the left, in a new register in the right hand, and then the left hand. And uh, the middle section, I think, is incredibly beautiful uh, with the, it's, it's yeah. very aggressive. Um, some two against three challenges uh, when you get into bar 66. Um, and again, sometimes just some of the leaps can be a little bit challenging. There's an interesting return to the first theme. Uh, she goes through some lovely modulations on the third page. I'll just play a bit of it. So we're in A major. cello rando that leads back to the main theme. Then to end it, uh, the coda is um, again rather lively and interesting use of harmonies. So we are we're ending in A major. progression in using B flat major triads. And one 
final statement of the theme. And then to end, we start pianissimo. And sort of this great ascent using that um, rhythmic motive all the way up. So it's, it's, it's a fun piece. Um, I think it'd make a great recital piece. It's a great ending. Yes. Yeah, so we brilliant. Yeah. And just the contrast between the the opening section, which is lively, and then that beautiful expressive middle section. It's um it's just sort of full of surprises all the way through. So it it's very musically satisfying. And another composer that we're going to look at is Helen Hopekirk, uh, who was born in 1856 in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, she was the second child of a printer, bookseller, and piano retailer. She received her early piano training from Miss Stone, who was a governess at Windsor Lodge Academy. In her teens, she attended the Edinburgh Institution for the Education of Young Ladies, studying piano and music theory, and she appeared as a soloist with the Edinburgh Amateur Orchestra Society on three occasions. When her father passed away, she continued her musical education under several uh, teachers, including Carl Reinecke at the Leipzig Conservatory. By her mid-20s, she'd appeared with the orchestras of the Gewandhaus House in Leipzig and the Crystal Palace in London. She married William Wilson, a partner in the Edinburgh Rope and Twine manufacturing firm. For several years, he limited his business activity in order to manage her concert tours. He organized two tours in Great Britain for her with a total of 42 recital, chamber music, and orchestral appearances. So 42 concerts in two years. She had a repertoire probably larger than that of any other pianist except Rubinstein. After this, she went to the United States on an extended tour. She appeared in New York, Brooklyn, Chicago, and Boston, presenting four different programs in as few as 12 days. She was lauded for her um, music, um, musical pianism and prestigious memory. The Chicago Tribune remarked that her well-attended recitals had done more for musical taste than any other recitals previously in Chicago. After her American tour, she wanted to study piano again with a master teacher. However, her first choice, Franz Liszt, had died. But her second choice, Theodore Leszczynski, became the single greatest influence on her playing and teaching. She worked with Leszczynski in Vienna and where she acquired an expanded tonal variety that was possible through his approach integrating finger technique with the use of the wrist, arm and shoulder. So you have to remember that piano technique was still fairly new at this point because the instrument really had just started to come into being as, as a major instrument. So coming out of the time of the harpsichord and the forte piano, now they were employing a lot more arm, arm weight and of course with that wrist action as well. Her second tour uh, in 1891 to 92 comprised recitals as well as appearances with orchestras. After she went back to Europe, she reduced her performing and teaching activities to allow more time for composition. After her husband suffered a uh, um, traffic accident, she realized it became necessary for her to procure a dependable income. She accepted an invitation from Leipzig schoolmate, George Chadwick, to head the piano department of the New England Conservatory. So they moved to Boston in 1897. She remained at the conservatory for four years, and after that taught privately in her home in Massachusetts. And to perform in major venues throughout New England. After 1900, she turned very much to the work of the late Romantic and French Impressionist composers. She gave American premieres of works by Vincent Dindy and Gabrielle Faure. Her performances of works by Claude Debussy were among the first heard by Boston audiences. Her last extended stay in Scotland was in 1919 to 1920, when she presented her piano concerto with the Scottish Orchestra. The list of her performances in the US and Canada continued to include, including 200 solo recitals and 12 appearances with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Her, she was best known as a teacher and um, 
as a pianist and teacher, but composition remained her strong interest. She started writing when she was at the Leipzig Conservatory. Uh, when they moved to Boston, she became the only foreign-born member of the city's famous circle of composers. That included George Chadwick, Amy Beach, Arthur Foote, and Mabel Daniels. I tried to find uh, um, a record of any of her concerts in Canada. I didn't have a chance to look extensively, but I did go through Elaine, uh, Elaine Keeler's book, and there was no mention of it, so I'm going to continue to see if I can find something about her, where she, where she performed in Canada. The most distinctive elements of her music after 1900 came from her Scottish heritage. She, in, through, sorry, in the summers of 1901 through 1908, she investigated the music of the Highland Scots and made frequent trips to Iona and her beloved Edinburgh. So her, these experiences along with her friendship with Marjorie Kennedy Fraser and close readings of poetry by Fiona MacDonald provided inspiration for a spate of folk inspired songs and character pieces for piano in the last 30 years of her career. So she died in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1945. So I'm just going to play a little bit of the romance that she wrote for you. And again, a beautiful character piece. And that's at level 10, right? Uh, at, it's on the, I'm not sure, it's on the Royal Conservatory ARCT list. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me just check what I have it here. I have it as associate, but I could oh. be, I'll have to recheck. The scary okay. level nine, I believe. Yes. Okay. like the scherzo, um, a very beautiful contrasting middle section. 
So the A section is a very passionate in A minor. What what astounds me is the how specific she is about dynamics and the, the contrast. If you look, uh, measure 18, bottom of the first page, we're going to a forte, and then immediately the next bar is a piano. So it's a very, very emotional uh, work. The B section, which is the second page you see there, page 84, is in C major. And um, again, extreme dynamics, where by the third line, we're back to a fortissimo. We start at mezzo piano at the top of the page, moved as strong as a fortissimo. And then if you look at bar 59, back down to piano. So really extreme dynamics, very, very emotional. It's challenging. Um, my hands are not large, so I find some of the the reaches with the octave and the repeating notes in the middle um, a little bit challenging. Um, the big thing in this is the voicing, making sure that the top notes, the melodic line is always there, uh, that it's clearly audible. And it's sometimes in um, unison with the tenor line. to support the uh, the crescendos when the main melody in the right hand is resting so a very 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 expressive piece if you have an emotional student or a very mm -hmm. expressive player this would be um, really a lovely piece for them to play the ending ends um, fortissimo sorry After this big outcry for about the last two lines of, of, of you know very expressive fortissimo suddenly down to pianissimo so uh, really you know a beautiful beautiful piece yeah it, it is and full of the effects are very successful yeah yeah it's well yeah. written it's just grabs you Beautiful use of harmonies, you know, just unexpected, like, you know, the going into that C major section in the, the middle yep. is just warm, warm and fuzzy feeling. Yeah. All right. And Cecile, take us on to Estefan. Okay. And now for something completely different, we're going back to uh, something, a much lighter uh, spirit. Uh, Esther Kahn, she was born in 1877 in London uh, and died in 1962 in Australia. So we're changing continent here. Um, her family was of German Jewish descent. She was a child prodigy and she gave her first public performance as a pianist at five years old. She won a scholarship. I think it was to go to the Gildal School of Music and Drama but the family moved to Australia at that point. So she continued her studies in Australia. Uh, her first compositions were published in the 1890s. Um, she wrote pieces for piano, organ. She wrote songs also in chamber music. Um, and as many others, she used male pseudonym. So if you see Charles Stewart, S-T-E-W or Charles Stewart, S-T-U-A-R-T, uh, it's her. Uh, she also used uh, Ivan Romanov as a pseudonym. Uh, her musical style was is in the English and European traditions that had been the ground roots of her own musical upbringing. So we're talking post-romantic, what is called salon music, um, but it's it's really good salon music, very uh, well written, entertaining. She became one of Australia's most successful women composers, um, and there's uh, around twenty three piano solo pieces that we have from her. She was also the first music therapist in Australia. 
and she's the one who set up the International Society for Musical Therapeutics, which is one of the first associations for musical therapy. Now, uh, the piece we're looking at today is the Intermezzo number no. two, Opus 30, that was written and published in 1910. Um, again, salon music in the best tradition. Uh, she, it's dedicated to Lillian Frost, who she was also a pianist and organist, and they were uh, close friends. So um, here is the intermezzo. <laughs> piece, uh, light, bubbly, uh, an intermezzo, the definition is a short musical entertainment of light character, a short independent musical composition. And that's exactly what it is. It's simple, no pretense. Um, and you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, mental health. This is a piece because of the character, because of the way it's written, it's, it's good for students' mental health. They are often, as we said earlier, under heavy pressure and pieces like that, they help to alleviate that pressure. And it gives them the opportunity to, to lighten up a bit while you know working on their technique, their musicality, uh, uh, growing as pianists, because it's not an easy piece for uh, a level eight, um, but it's, uh, in terms of character, it's another piece that's full of fantasy. Uh, it's spontaneous, joyful, and definitely uplifting. At least I found it uplifting working on it. Uh, it involves, uh, as I said, it's not an easy piece. It involves serious work in on phrasing, elasticity in rubato. Uh, you need to control the, to know the text really well to, uh, how could I say that, to control the, uh, the elasticity of it, to, to feel the, the rubato, where the phrase is going, where you can take time. She has many uh, fermatas. 
So how do you get there to bring them out so that they make musical sense? Um, lots of changes of dynamics also, uh, sudden changes, you know, pianissimo, 40. Uh, again, uh, different sections. Uh, you go from uh, moderato with grace uh, at the beginning to piumoso, uh, the section page two with con anima, and then back to the character of the beginning, con grazia, and the piumoso, which is like definitely more decided. Um, and it's going from, like I said, you have to know the text really well to be able, able to, to play with those changes of directions, uh, the shaping of the phrases, the changes of character, like switching from one to, to the other. But um, you get staccato touch in the bell uh, that's used very, very well, I think. And the legato, having the bass, uh, the bass melody, uh, for example, bar nine. And lots of skips on the keyboard also. Kind of things that needs to uh, to be worked on. Um, left hand chords, of course. Uh, it's a good piece to do some harmonic analysis. That the you're in the flat, B flat major, the chords, the cadences, uh, to understand the the, um, the character, the structure of the piece. But most, the most challenging of that piece I found was the pedal. Uh, she's very precise with the indications and the, um, the pedaling that she wrote plays a key role in the, 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 the character in creating the light, bubbly, humorous, carefree character of the pieces. And it's like, you can hear it. That makes it quite um, funny and gives that free, uh, freedom uh, feeling, that spontaneity. Um, yeah, I think that's. Yeah, uh, the pieces, uh, the three, uh, the first three uh, are in the volume three of the Women Composers, Three Centuries of Keyboard Works. The con is in volume two. So I alluded earlier about why we weren't covering Canadian composers. So copyright is the biggest issue. Uh, these composers, the Canadian copyright laws just changed at the end of, of last year. Initially, the composer had to be dead for 50 years, and now it's 70 years. So that makes it difficult to publish. In some cases, the publishing companies no longer exist, but technically they still hold the copyright. So there's no way of securing that. Um, I never thought Canada had much of a history in music. You know, I'll be honest. I it's a, Canada's a, a young country, and I always thought, oh, there's no history here. And then I came across Elaine Keeler's book, and I took it out of the library. It's called Music in Canada, Capturing Landscape and Diversity. And I have to stand corrected. Canada has quite a colorful history of music. And in fact, I like the book so much, I bought my own copy. So if you're looking for some summer reading, uh, this is a fabulous book. And really, you know, I think with the push of Canadian studies in the school system, this is a book that would be extremely useful just for students to become aware of our of, of our heritage and a her it's a heritage to be proud of. Um, 
I'll let Cecile talk a little more about the Canadian composers, but I just want to quickly mention another book that I just have purchased, Clara Schumann, The Artist and the Woman by Nancy Reich. This is a fabulous book. This is better than any fiction I've read in a long time. So if you're looking for summertime reading, uh, two highly recommended books. And uh, it really enlightened me to Clara Schumann's life uh, even more. And wow, what, what a childhood. I've hardly started into it. I think I'm on page 43 and I'm just blown away by what this woman, what, what she went through in life. So highly recommend those two books as summertime reading. So Cecile, do you want to talk a little bit about some other Canadian composers? Well, a few composers that we found, uh, there were, uh, like, like you were saying, you know, I, I also was under the impression that there was no women composers in Canada before the 1930s uh, and 40s. Uh, but there indeed, there were some in the 19th century. So a few names. Uh, there's uh, Susan Frances Harrison. Uh, and she, she wrote, um, she was an authority on folk music in her life. And uh, uh, many of her works were inspired by the music of French Canada, French, French songs. Um, and she was, she was published. Uh, there is a book that I can show you that uh, I was lucky enough to, to find, but it's very hard now. Um, it's, it's this one that was published by a Canadian musical, uh, by Patrimoine Canada. Uh, the Canadian Musical Heritage. Um, there's many volumes and there's this one on piano music. And this one uh, has one piece uh, by Susie, Susan Francis Harrison uh, called Chant Voyageur. It was part of um, uh, a three piece suite. Um, at the moment, apart from this, uh, you can find them only on the site archives.org if you're interested. There are some also, there's two sites, um, archives.org and numérique.bank.qc.ca, uh, Bibliothèque and Archive Nationale du Québec, um, National Archives and Library of Quebec. Um, but, but again, we're talking about very, really old editions with yellow papers, and sometimes it's very hard to, to read. So I, I hope that soon we'll be able to have modern editions because those pieces are really interesting. Another one was uh, Frances J. Hatton. Uh, her father was, she was from England. Her father was a very well-known musician and composer there. She moved to Canada in 1869 and, and held a position as music teacher at the Elmet Ladies College in London, Ontario. And again, she, she wrote very, very colorful, very interesting pieces. Last summer, Eleonore and I um, looked at Gina Branscombe. And I find that situation so, so sad. G Gina Branscombe was born in 1881 uh, and she moved to New York at one point, right, you know? Yes. And she, but she kept her uh, dual citizenship and she always considered herself as Canadian. We had the opportunity to, uh, to look at and play many, many of her works for piano and they're beautiful. And I, we wish we could teach them, we could be able to teach them, but they're caught in one of those publishing situation where we cannot use them at the moment. Gina Branscombe's uh, society or association that's trying to look into this, but yes, the publishers are gone. And I checked actually with a couple of authorities in the music industry who kind of go back and have worked in the U.S. and very, you know, involved in publishing. And uh, the path led to 
a music store that used to exist on on Young Street in Toronto, but even the owner there is dead, and so it's just our hands are tied. It's really a shame, and this is what happens in the music industry. I mean, it's happening today where a large publishing company in the US just fired a number of their writers but have have kept the copyrights so these writers no longer have access to their own works they have to start from scratch and this is you know when when a publisher takes on a writer uh, many times they are asked to relinquish their copyright and uh, so if the um, if the publishing company goes goes under, goes bankrupt, the works are lost. Yeah, and she's a composer who wrote for all levels. Uh, she wrote for her, her daughters when they started piano. So we have, uh, how do you say that? Um, beginners, pieces for beginners and up to uh, concert pieces. And another one, uh, that was from uh, Montreal, who studied in in uh, in France, uh, was uh, Albertine Morin Labrec, who was very well known. Also, she was born in 1886 and uh, died in 1957. Uh, she she wrote a piano method. I think, from my knowledge, it was one one of the first, if not the first piano methods written in, in Canada, was published in 1920. And again, it's on uh, the dot bank, uh, National Archives of Quebec. She wrote many, many pieces for piano uh, from for beginners, from beginners to concert pieces, uh, mostly, most of them were published before the 1930s. Um, again, very interesting piece. She wrote a book uh, called uh, The Art of Studying the Piano, uh, published in 1922. So she was very active in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, she also wrote biographies of Mozart, Liszt, Mendelssohn, and a few other composers. I found that there's a few of her pieces that have been recorded on YouTube. Uh, Chanson Triste and Arabesque, among others. Uh, so, um, but I, she was published in Montreal uh, at the time, the Archambault, which is a big music store in Montreal, uh, was also a publisher. So most of her works were published by, by Archambault. And uh, that's it. They're not available in paper at the moment. And I really hope that one day we'll have access to that because it's really, I mean, all the pieces that I looked at were really, really interesting. And I just want to mention this. It's uh, the first piece by a Canadian woman that we know of that was published in 1841. It's called the Canada Union Waltz, and nobody knows the name of that composer. It says, a Canadian lady. That's it. <laughs> so just, again, it's it's light, it's subtle music. I'll just play the beginning so you have an idea of the style. fun piece, it's well written. Uh, and this was published by Clifford Ford uh, Publications, who was also involved with Ellen Keeler on, on this. Um, 
and it's uh, I got it from the Canadian Music Center. So, so but there's a lot, definitely a lot to do in that field. Ellen Keeler, I've done a wonderful work over the years trying to, you know, bringing those uh, women composers, uh, I was going to say back to the surface. Uh, and there's still lots of work to, to do to make them known and, uh, and played. Because right now we were facing a wall. Absolutely, absolutely. But times change. So who knows what lies ahead? I, when I think back to uh, two years ago, I, most of these women I'd never heard of. So uh, I mean, my knowledge of women composers was Fanny Mendelssohn and Clara Schumann, and that was it. And I really, you know, it, embarrassingly never gave thought to it. And uh, it, it's it's really, it's, a, it, it's almost like it's become almost a hobby for me because I enjoy it so much. You know, you, it's, it's work you think is work and hobbies are fun. Well, it's actually a lot of fun. It's just a lot of fun discovering these works and I'm finding more and more of them. So got two more publications coming out hopefully by the summer and uh, yeah, onward and upward. We'll have more to present next year. Yes. That would be great. That would be really lovely. I enjoy listening to all this new music and I'm looking through my books that you've sent me to see where where those pieces are and uh, the romance that you played especially is still in my ear and I look forward to learning that this summer. Um, Elaine Keeler, just about her, I know she sent me a bunch of CDs that we've got of Canadian music. She's ex she's recorded quite extensively a lot of Canadian music. Yes. Uh, and I'm trying to think of a dream of a way to get these CDs out there in people's hands, some of our people that are watching the webinar. So maybe that's something we can consider next year uh, as a way of disseminating some of those recordings. Yeah, and, and Derek, I think I don't have the, the title of the CD, but there's a CD uh, on which she recorded some some of uh, the pieces by, that I mentioned uh, by uh, Hatton, um, Francis Hatton and Francis uh, Arison. There's actually a CD included with this book as well. Ah, wonderful. Yeah, I haven't listened to it, um, but uh, it was it says a CD of previously unrecorded Canadian music performed by the author is included. Yeah, I'm sure that's a standard text in a lot of universities in Canada when they offer I'm sure most university music programs offer a course music in Canada, I believe. I found this at the Whitby Library. So if the Whitby Library has a copy, I'm sure uh, the Whitby Library does not have a lot of mu uh, a lot of music books. So if they've got it in their library, I'm sure, you know, others do. But yeah, I, I liked it so much in the library. I just finally got my own copy. Yeah, yeah. And I found it at the Ottawa Public Library also. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks both of you for the informative uh, session again, as always, and for your sensitive playing and, and giving us an idea of the music and what's coming across beautifully. And people can watch this, I'm sure, on YouTube later and hear the music and, and they'll enjoy exploring it. And as exams start coming up here in June, I hope that when we're out traveling, examining all three of us in different places, that we start to hear some of this music coming forward. It'd be really great to hear. And like we've mentioned, all of, these, all of this music is on the CC Classical Piano Syllabus now. You can find those copies online. And that's the only copy you'll find of our updated syllabus. And in the meantime, hope you all have a great summer. Um, I know it's a busy time of year for everybody. Studio teachers, I hope you can get gracefully into July and August and that you have some time off and we'll reconnect everyone here in September and love to have both of you back as our mainstay again next year. If you have all that music and, and you have the desire, we'll have you back several times and explore more of this wonderful music. Well, sure. thanks. Terrific. Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. Have a great weekend, everybody. Stay in touch and we'll connect again soon enough. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.